Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, episode 52, a conversation with folk duo The Lowest Pair with new comedy from Paige Weldon. I'm your host, Nick Zeno. I sat down with Kendall Winter and Palmer T. Lee at Cinema Salem in Salem, Massachusetts a few months ago to talk about songwriting, what type of person plays the banjo, how limitations can spark creativity, and the two albums they released in 2016, Uncertain As It Is, Uneven, and Fern Girl. They come at their music from a tradition of bluegrass and acoustic music, and when they played live, it was just the two of them and two microphones, as elemental as it gets on stage. They're interested in expanding that sound in the future, so keep an ear out for their next projects. They'll be working on a new album together, and both have completed solo albums that have yet to be released. They have a gentle spirit and a quirky sense of humor, and that comes across in the music and in conversation. The name The Lowest Pair for the Curious comes from a twist on the Lord's Prayer that songwriter and fiddle player John Hartford wrote. Give us today or d'oeuvres in bed as we forgive those who dressed up against us. If you're Catholic or were once Catholic, you know the cadence. I started the conversation explaining that the Department of Tangents centers around comedy, music, and horror, and that led to a discussion of the movie Get Out and what effect the soundtrack had on the action, which is where we begin the conversation. Stay tuned after the interview for this week's featured track, new comedy from Paige Weldon's album Girlfriend at the Time, which came out today, February 23rd, on A Special Thing Records. And now, The Lowest Pair. I think it's called the other day. Oh yeah, That's and that awesome. was like, it starts. Uh, have you seen it? Yeah, it starts like so subtly, but the 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 music adds so much of so much tension to what's going on that like before you even realize that it's like kind of a horror movie, like you can already like you're already like what? Why is everything? Well, weird? everything's why very is exaggerated. This so suspicious. Here, it it's so then. crazy. But it's mo- it seemed like I was reflecting on it just like it's the music that's. Making you feel that way. Yeah. The music can can kind of make or break a film sometimes. If you do it too much, it can indicate. You know, you can foreshadow with music a little too much. Mm-hmm. Like something creepy is about to happen. Like, all right, well now I'm prepared for it. You right. don't want to be obvious right. about it. I feel like get but out. That one, like nothing creepy really happened for quite a long well, that's time. That's what I feel. But the music kept going. That's what I feel like. That was the point, right? Like it kept making yeah. you scared in moments. Like to be like suspicious. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, it kept leading you to a point where you knew something was going to be wrong eventually. Right. Because it's called Get Out. Right. Um, so that that makes you search around the frame for anything that's, that's going to happen. I mean, but there there were some there were some creepy relationships. You know what was going on with with the help mm-hmm. in, in that I, house. Nothing's creepy. Nothing's very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you like horror films or you did? Typically not. I don't really, like, enjoy feeling scared, you know, or if I have to, like, walk to the store, walk home from the theater, and it's dark, and I just watch a horror movie, I get all freaked out, you know? Uh-huh. I don't really like that very much, but it is nice to just be in a place among friends and, like, watch this really intense, have this really intense experience, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like horror movies that are too similar to something I w- that would, like, could happen to me. So if it's, like, pretty far out or, like, spooky or, like... I can enjoy that, but if it's too close to like something like that, demons and like I mean, I don't want to have any more fear around being alone, like uh, as a woman, like anything that kind of enhances like those fears. I like, would rather not really watch that, but anything that's just like a little supernatural or stuff like that, I like that. So Halloween or, or Hush or any of those movies where somebody's home alone and yeah, all of a sudden out in the middle just of nowhere. Crazy person. That's like the last thing I want to like be worried about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, our first complete and utter tangent. <laughs> so it takes a, a, a spe- <laughs> yes, it, it takes a, a special kind of person, I, I would think, to to pick up a, a banjo, and you both play. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I think that too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you both play banjo. Is it, would you say it's it's your main instrument for both of you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that. Um, although I've been focusing more on guitar lately, um, 
I didn't really start playing guitar until this band started, and kind of slowly I've been cultivating more interest in it mm -hmm. um, and spending a lot more time trying to actually become a guitar player than, mm -hmm. than playing banjo. Um, but I imagine the pendulum will swing back at some point. I've been playing ba banjo for, what, like a dozen years or something. And, um, so, yeah, I, I guess, kind of. Uh, but maybe not today. <laughs> uh, and, and what about you? Uh, yeah, probably in that I um, feel the most confident on it. I definitely uh, go, I feel like it has a gravity that I um, definitely, like, kind of whirl around. Like in the, and that's kind of where I always keep coming back to the banjo. I pick up guitar a lot. I have definite, like, desires to be a fiddle player or, like, a dobro player or something else. But, yeah, banjo kind of is where I keep landing. Mm. <laughs> what drew you to the instrument? Um, I heard... Bella Flex, Tales from the Acoustic Planet, when I was 18, and had just moved from Arkansas to Olympia, Washington, and got a babysitting gig in exchange for this cabin. And I was I had this two-year-old girl that I was watching, and I just p put in the CD randomly. And that's the right album, I think, right? Is it live? Tales from the Acoustic Planet? The one with... Um... Dicka, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just yep. is like, it's like super yep. fun and that it's one. lively and it's not bluegrass. Um, mm. Like it was just like, oh, this instrument is making me dance. And I suddenly mm. was like, whoa, this is cool. And then I met a friend that had a banjo at the same time. So I think I just suddenly was like open to the banjo. Or I don't think I'd even really acknowledged it when I grew up in Arkansas because it was just kind of around and not really part of my culture. Mm -hmm. What made you gravitate towards um, I think really is just that it was um, not the guitar, uh -huh. you know? Um, I'd started playing, I was playing guitar for maybe four or six months or something, um, just as a vehicle to write songs, to do something with my writing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and my family caught wind that I was learning, um, and that I was like playing music and interested in music, and so I just inherited two banjos from my extended family. Um, so I just kind of, they're really cool, you know, like it's kind of a tinkerer's instrument, it's all modular parts, you know, so I took mm -hmm. them both apart and kind of like reassembled one. Franken banjo. Franken banjo, kind of <laughs> in a more ideal state than the two that I had gotten the way I saw it. And I just thought it was more interesting, you know, like I grew up playing hockey, but I always wanted to be a goalie, you know, that kind of thing, you know, I always uh -huh. wanted to do like, the thing but the other thing, you know? So when I was playing guitar, it was really natural for me to go to the banjo, I think. Was everybody else playing like classic rock or something around you and you just didn't want to Yeah, like everybody plays the same the guitar, thing. you know, like whatever. <laughs> uh, do you find it it's a it's the the instrument you write on? Um I used to write on it a lot more. Because um, it was like the only instrument I played for, for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Um and now I still write songs on it, but less less often. But I guess that just goes with you know my general music direction right now, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I would say I'd say I write on I write different songs on different on the different instruments, guitar mm -hmm. or banjo. Like banjo, it's rare that like I feel like more melody driven tunes are I write more melody driven tunes on the banjo. Mm -hmm. I think, but I kind of go back and forth a lot because sometimes I'll find a melody and then go to guitar for the voicing, mm -hmm. or um, I'll find a groove on the banjo and then just try to figure out what, because um, the banjo's got a lot of notes, like what kind of long note I can hold over it. But I think I would write really differently. I think I think they write different songs. I think that's very true. Yeah, get completely different types of songs mm -hmm. out of writing on the banjo versus writing on the guitar. Well, the temptation on guitar would be to play the big sweeping chords. Mm -hmm. Whereas the banjo, you have to pick things out a little bit. Yeah, more. you're kind of creating patterns to work with. Yeah, arpeggiating chords and things like that. The guitar feels like a softer pad, like to like to land like on. Like less intrusive. Or yeah, something. the oh, banjo's like me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, okay, I heard you. The banjo, you'd wind up with like more uh, counterpoint, like point and counterpoint. I would think. Whereas a guitar, mm -hmm. you would just sort of write something. Where the the maybe the the melody and the the chords are going in the same direction a little bit more. I could say that, yeah, that definitely 
happens, I'm sure, yeah. Or you create a melody on the guitar, on the banjo, but it's it's like built out of patterns, so you might not even necessarily hear it as a melody and then write a melody over it, and then the way that they interact becomes pretty interesting, especially when you get both banjos involved in it. And if we're, we don't do it a whole lot, but we play some tunes where we both play finger style, you know, so we're trying to figure out ways where that can actually cooperate without just being this big, you know, overload of banjo uh -huh. notes. Like a know? bunch of raindrops um, trying to hear it hit the same spot. <laughs> Yeah, so then all of a sudden you end up with all these different patterns going on, um, and then like the vocal melody might go along with that, might echo that, might um, yeah be a counterpoint situation. But the, and then there's harmony on the vocals as well, and maybe harmony with the banjo part. Yeah, it can be complicated for better and worse. Mm -hmm. I often I like finding something kind of on one instrument, switching it to the other, and just seeing where it goes from there, because I feel like you maybe wouldn't come up with it there, you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's kind of fun to just see, like, this kind of strange, like, maybe, maybe, like, a melody on the banjo that you try to play on the guitar, and then, like, see what happens with the guitar's influence, and then take it back to the banjo. How many in uh, instruments do you each play? On the road, we each bring two. Mm -hmm. I studied harmonica in college, but I haven't taken it really seriously in you six play or it seven really years. Well, though. You, you bring that on the road, too. Like oh, that would, that would count. Yeah, I do bring it on the road, but there's probably only, you know, we've probably only recorded maybe three, maybe, I think maybe just three songs where I'm playing the harp mm -hmm. on records. and Yeah, but once in a while, those will make it into the sets. I'd really That's like really to get great. back to spending more time with harp. But yeah, mostly just banjo and guitar each. And then we're both kind of like dream of someday being fiddlers as well. <laughs> we both own fiddles and, you know. It's difficult though, because we fly a lot to um, start our tours. So I think a lot of our um, simplicity on, on the instruments on stage is due to how many instruments we want to be traveling mm -hmm. with. Whereas I think if we like had a big van and came from like Olympia, we could just stick like all the banjos and like in the car and all yeah. the all the guitars and like really ideally we would probably explore. have four or five banjos and at least three two or three guitars we'd explore it a lot bigger but it's kind of nice to also say like okay i have an instrument on my back and the song like that's all it needs like we can figure it out right well you, it, it's just uh is it going to be tonight just the one vocal mic and one uh instrument mic the way you've done it frequently in the past probably yeah. mm -hmm. does that does that put any pressure on you because it's you know the, the focus is all right there on two people, two microphones. For me, it alleviates so much pressure to be p to play into microphones. Mm -hmm. um, I find... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I just feel like when you when you plug instruments in, I don't know, like there's something about electrifying the in instrument where it <clears throat> it's much more challenging to get um, the dynamic subtlety. Um, I mean, it's definitely attainable, of course, right? But... Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's much easier to be able to work a microphone in that way. You know, I can, like, hit a chord, you know, pretty hard, and I can, like, also hit that chord with the guitar right up to the mic if I really want it to be the thing that's going on. And um, Yeah, I think I find it to be much more comfortable than plugging in. If it's, like, a totally quiet listening room, the one mic is the best thing ever because we can just kind of look at each other and, and like hear all the sounds including like the quiet part of the composition you know because mm -hmm. when you're playing over like people talking and whatnot then that part of the song that is the quiet like gets kind of washed through a wash and so I feel like sometimes when we're playing more like busy rooms um, I love plugging in because then there's a whole nother like soundscape happening you're getting this Kind of weird electronic. Mm -hmm. And I think also if we, we did, with that yeah, too. if we did tour with a big van and all, had all sorts of space, we'd probably bring some amps with us too and be able to play with more of those sounds, have a little more control and play with feedback and you know have a couple of pedals and weird stuff uh -huh. like that. Do you want to do that? Do you want to tour with a a bigger band? I think it'd be nice to have options. You know, one thing we've talked about doing is um, like we're doing two sets tonight. So for instance, if we came in. Um, we could do like a single mic set first, you know, and then come back and sort of do like a kind of a noisier set. ruckus, you <laughs> know, um, yeah, and just kind of get weird and stuff. I think that'd be really fun. 
Um, and, you know, everybody had it, would have their opinion about it, and, and that's fine, but I think it's really important to to not allow yourself to really get pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. So the next album is going to be all synths, then? <laughs> Probably not. I'm not committing to anything. <laughs> uh, well, well, does that help uh, that you do so much of it's just the, the two of you and two mics on the road? Does that help when you get into the studio to record? Does that make things a little simpler uh, to catch? Every record in the past, yes, we've done it exactly yeah. like that. I would, I would, yeah, I'd almost say, though, it's um, um, kind, of, kind of a double-edged sword. You know, because we've learned all the songs, playing them live, um, and then when we go to make our records, we just play them live. Um, and then when you do that, though, you just kind of get what you get, mm -hmm. you know. So then, like, there might be songs a couple years later when you're listening to a record that you made that where you're just like, oh man, I can't believe I messed that note up or that chord or forgot that line, but we just kind of had to, we just pushed through it, you know. It is what it is. And mm -hmm. But it's kind of a blessing also to have that kind of restriction around just like this is just this is just what it is like this is how we get the energy this is how the song sounds with just the two of us and maybe like down the line we could get like pull out like the best songs or something and get like a full band back them like give them another like round with with that energy that would be really fun but I almost think that the limit is actually what keeps us like um, in the bubble because if we really broke out of it, then we would just be screwed because there's so many possibilities. <laughs> yeah, limitations can sometimes spark your creativity as, as much as options. Yeah. A little cool. no, is, doesn't Hartford have a Yeah, I think it was like some, Yeah, I think he said something like style is defined by limitation or something like that. Yeah, like that. and a lot of bands sound the way they sound because they were trying to sound like something else. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. they, and they couldn't and this is what you get yeah we're right. traditional bluegrass yeah. players really <laughs> at least that was the attempt at the outset but then like I don't know personally I just sucked at it and never got a hold of like really playing bluegrass banjo very well you know mm -hmm. and so I got what I got is tradition or tra uh, traditional bluegrass is that an important thing to you is that an important sound to, to reach for or to, to not, inspire not you not really for me, not not important in that like I would need to recreate it, but um, it's definitely a really fascinating riddle to try to figure out on the banjo how to do that thing, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a great exercise to just get your fingers moving. It's a, it's a really fun brain activity and really hard to do. So it's kind of I feel like I came into bluegrass more because of how fun it is to try to figure out how to do on the banjo, and then through that have like a, a love for it, a deep love for it, mm -hmm. but kind of out in the back door like or through the back door <laughs> or mm -hmm. however that, that works yeah yeah I feel similarly I, mean, I think that there are I mean I, I really appreciate that there are people who try to preserve a, a specific sound and style um, I think it's really important really but um, I don't really see that as my place you know mm -hmm. but I do have a tremendous amount of inspiration from listening to that music mm -hmm. um, but yeah minimal drive to really try to recreate that um, in any like whole sense you know mm -hmm. to make a, an entire piece really sound like that so much is just you know ripping off tunes and licks and melodies and stuff like that you know and valuing it in that way and and I think that you know I think that's an important thing in like the folk tradition you know, mm -hmm. to keep moving things forward. I mean, this is like, this is the 21st century, you know, like rock and roll has happened, you know, like, um, and I think that there's, you know, the other camp is fully embracing that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, bluegrass was even that, right? Like um, taking old time mountain music and kind of adding these like swing a aspects and um, sort of jazz aspects and putting, you know, having solos and highlighted people and, and really tight harmonies and things like right. that. Everything was new at one point, mm -hmm. which is not an argument that, that impresses traditionalists, I guess, right. sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah, and bluegrass yeah. is very specific. Like old time kind of, I feel like, covers more ground and just people being on porches and sharing songs and then the song goes to the next porch and sounds a little different and mm. kind of like it's carried around and has a little bit more um, uh, 
a more open, like, I mean, it's still a very specific thing, but I feel like it's more like everyone come play this song together and we'll all play together for a while. Mm, it's more inclusive. So everyone knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, more community oriented. And that's cool. That's really kind of a neat, mm-hmm. it's like telephone. I feel like old time, and bluegrass, but it's like kind of more like a telephone game where you're like, I heard this song, like, I'm going to play it. Right. to you and then you take it to the next guy and you're like Absolutely. oh yeah I swear I mean, this song was about grapes so many times you find pebbles. a tune and there's like <laughs> so many times you find a tune and you can find like three or four different variations like subtle or extreme variations on that tune the ways, the ways people have recorded it or you bring it to a jam and someone's like I swear that's a C not a C sharp you know at that one point in that like in the melody just passing that one time and you're like you know alright since I'm playing it with you, uh-huh. we'll play it. Is it right and we'll wrong? use a C note. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you pick up so, uh, certain things from other songs and sort of include them. I mean, you've got a song called uh, Oh, Susanna, which, you know, it, uh, somebody were to think that you you have a, a sort of traditional sound where to pick up that album would probably have a certain expectation of what that right. song would be. Mm-hmm. And we probably disappoint a lot of people. <laughs> and, and long black veil is weaved into a, a, into I forget what song it is. Uh, you did that? Yeah, you never noticed that. <laughs> Only reckon I'm fixing on kicking around the table. Yeah, on. what was it? Um, been all around this world, or we called oh, it yeah. "Hang Me" when we recorded it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Put long black veil there. Neither of us have. Oh well, I should speak for myself. I don't have an excellent memory, so sometimes <laughs> I'm trying to like sing a song actually, and then I just get distracted and then I kind of explore what ever I can like make up around it. So I think that that's how oh, Susanna kinda came to be. I was just singing it in traffic one day coming back from the <laughs> farmers market in Seattle to Olympia and I like just started making up the tune. Like but it came out of like me just like accidentally starting to sing a song that I've known since I was little. But didn't so quite know it as well as you thought you I did. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> well that's where that mutation comes in again. Where yeah, you're trying totally. You're trying for one thing, and you accidentally find yourself because you're not getting you're not getting to to what the song was. You're getting to what it is for you. Right, and it, it really was that actually. In that song, when I wrote it, as that really was that. Hmm. <laughs> Before I get too far away from this comment, a little while ago you said. I studied harmonica in college, which is not a statement that I hear from people <laughs> a, a lot. You're still paying for it. I'm still I paying for that it. That's a true statement. Was that, was that part of your major? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was nothing prestigious. I just went to a community college and spent too much time there trying to complete um, what they called a sound arts degree, uh-huh. um, which kind of had like a core... Um, <clears throat> I don't know, kind of kind of a core curriculum, but mostly you just kind of like piece together whatever, you know. Um, so there, you know, you kind of had to do like some basic physics things, um, music theory things. Um, mm-hmm. um, we played around, like there's some like uh, live sound reinforcement stuff, some, some studio work. Um, we had to know how to work tape machines and things. Um, understand synthesizers, the history of them. Um, and then, yeah, so as, as part of that, I studied harmonica with this guy named Clint Hoover, um, who, as far as I know, is from Minneapolis, but I think he lives in Philadelphia now. Um, yeah, he's a fantastic jazz harmonica player, and um, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a very hard instrument to play well. It's yeah. a very easy instrument to play okay. I find it to be parallel to the banjo in that way, to be entirely honest. Where it's like because banjo is often in an open tuning, you know, you can just pick one up and you it can. Sounds like a banjo can, off the get go. Yeah, and you can you can just day. fret your finger. Like if you're tuning an open chord, you can just put your finger down there and like get all. You're not going to play a wrong note, really. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, to play it well is kind of is kind of a nightmare. I mean, it's a puzzle, like Kendall was saying. You know, you just got to like figure out how the thing works in order to play it well, yeah. Yeah, when you see a, a, a bluegrass band really going for it and you see the fingers flying, it's just, it's a, I, I play guitar and it's hard for me to understand banjo when I watch, the right. especially the right hand. I don't have a quick picking hand or a good finger picking hand. So watching 
watching Banjo can be a little bit mystifying for me. I've only picked one up once or twice, so I don't mm -hmm. really... Maybe that would solve things for me if I tried, but it seems like it's a... You might just discover a rabbit hole that you wished you never would have <laughs> yeah. discovered. <laughs> I feel like mandolin players feel similarly about guitar players if they never picked up a ma uh, guitar or something. You know, like, why is it tuned like that? Uh, like, why <laughs> are the fingerings like that? It doesn't make any sense, you know? I feel like banjo is, like, further down that. Hmm. Like, when you look at how Bill Keith explored melodies, um, nothing about it's like it is intuitive. like doing somersaults up the neck. Yeah, <laughs> like, nothing, nothing about it makes sense. Like, like why would you do it like that? Because it like sounds amazing, and you can, like, it's... achieve fiddle tunes in this really super, yeah. technical way. But, like, man, the There's time he must have spent to find it. that. Mm -hmm. Have you heard Bela Fleck's Christmas album? No. Is that new? It came out several years ago. Okay. Uh, he does... It's very experimental. He does Jingle Bells with Tuvan Throat Singers. <laughs> and cool. it's just bizarre. <laughs> and I have to listen to it at least once. I've been, I've been really craving a banjo uh, Hanukkah album. I'm curious if that's out there. I know there's Jewgrass, but I, didn't, I don't know if there's... Banjo There's plenty of Jewish album. banjo players mm -hmm, I know. probably call on it's very true. It's very true. and uh, get something going. Maybe yeah. it could be like a compilation album or something. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Are, are you of the faith or you, do you just see a, a hole in the market there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kendall's Jewish. I'm, I'm one of the few Jews uh, okay. from Arkansas. Uh -huh. I'm one of four. <laughs> three now. <laughs> There's three there now. <laughs> <laughs> you all know each other. And yeah. yeah, we all went to the temple together. Hmm. <laughs> Shalom, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> what were you listening to growing up? What was the, the music that inspired? Um, I was, well, my parents were both classical musicians, so my sister and I were stuck in, like, the pits of orchestras, like, in Little Rock, um, quite a bit growing up and, and listening to musicals and that kind of thing at home. Um, I got into punk rock when I was in high school with a bunch of buddies. Um, and, like, the Arkansas, like, punk rock scene is amazing. Um, and it's also just like all the alternative scenes kind of grouped together. Like it's not very, it's punk, but it's like, it's not really specifically punk. It's more just like anybody that found music that wasn't on the radio, like shared it. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I kind of got into like listening to Williams and Gillian Welsh then. And uh, I go all these different songwriters at, this, at the same time, like Dar Williams at the same time as I was getting into punk. And so I was, I had got, got a guitar for Hanukkah. So I was kind of just listening to anything that wasn't mainstream and that maybe made the effort to come to Arkansas <laughs> and pass through like a lot of local bands. And, mm -hmm. and then I got turned on to Riot Girl music and moved to Olympia kind of inspired by that. So that was kind of my childhood mm -hmm. piece. How about you? What were you listening to as a kid? I'm definitely into the mainstream um, <laughs> much more. Uh -huh. um, I mean, not so much like modern stuff, but I was like really into like, um, I don't know, like reggae stuff, like Toots and Bob Marley and um, classic rock, you know, um, all the big like vocal harmony bands, you know, like Kansas and things like that. Led love Led Zeppelin, st still love Led Zeppelin. Um, I'm almost, it's almost embarrassing to admit post Big Lebowski, but I'm a big Eagles fan. Mm. Um, Has most of your life been post Big Lebowski? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when that movie came out. I wonder, but maybe I didn't see it until later and realized that I wasn't <laughs> supposed to like the Eagles. But what a fantastic band! It's been like ninety four, so ninety five that came out. I think. Really? No way. Yeah, yeah, I totally just missed the boat that I wasn't supposed to like the Eagles. Mm. Um, but yeah, great songs, like really fantastic production. Yeah. Well, I think I think people. Uh, People sometimes put the Eagles into different categories, whether it's pre-Joe Walsh or post-Joe Walsh. He seems sure. to be the one that, that uh, allows Eagle haters to give them <laughs> a pass. But, I mean, they were, I mean, like, so many great songs from, like, the whole mess of them, you know? Like, they were all writing and collaborating. Um, I don't know. A, a tribute album in the works. Mm, I don't. I don't know. I think I'd get shunned if I pulled 
something like that. Why? I think I just have to stay in the closet with my eagles. You think people really do hate the eagles? I don't know. Uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> I think so. Like, one of the best-selling albums of all time, their their uh, greatest hits album. So, is that right? Maybe the Eagles paid the Big Lebowski to say that, just so people started paying attention, more paying attention. <laughs> Maybe, but yeah, I remember when I was uh, when I was in junior high, I really wanted to be the singer of a band and sort of like mesh, um, sort of like the styles of Bob Marley and Robert Plant. Mm -hmm. um, do be able to achieve those falsettos and kind of that really interesting um, vibrato that Bob was able to do and um, yeah that was kind of my bag and I mean even I think for a long time maybe even still now like those are my biggest vocal influences in mm -hmm. a lot of ways um, and then I think just via you know that kind of like <clears throat> I don't know classic rock thing listening to my dad's records and stuff like that um, got into like uh, Simon and Garfunkel and found, and I was working at a record store and found like a B sides collection, you know, mm -hmm. where it was like uh, just Paul Simon sometimes or just the two of them really stripped down with just a just a guitar um, and all these songs of theirs that I'd never heard before, um, and I think that kind of segued me more into folk music, you know, um, and then in high school got turned on to like. Um, Shady Grove and the Pizza Tapes, um, the stuff that Garcia and Grisman were doing in the mm -hmm. early 90s, you know, so it got turned up Tony Rice through that, um, which was, you know, an obvious catalyst into the bluegrass world. And around that time, when I was in high school, I think, or maybe I was still in junior high, I don't know, but um, Oh Brother, We're Out There, Out There, you know what I mean, the, <laughs> the, fa the famous movie came out. <laughs> you know, so I think, like, a lot of things really slowly moved me in that direction. So basically the Coen brothers formed your musical. <laughs> wow, that's probably true. It was, it was pivotal for sure. Yeah, between between Paul Simon, Jerry Garcia, and the Coen brothers, I think, catalyzed my musical career. Yeah. Did you both want to play music right away, or did, was there one band or one show that made you think, I've got to do this myself, I've got to get up there and... And play. I think I wanted to right away. Well, I think actually both of us like kind of were always wrote like in school. Like I wrote a lot of poetry and stuff. My mom always encouraged me to um, write a song. But mm -hmm. because also I could sing or like apparently hold a note or something. <laughs> and you kind of have a similar story to that. Right? Mm -hmm. I was doing some poetry readings and things in high school and just didn't feel like it was quite doing the thing you know I didn't quite didn't quite have the guts for it either I think too um, but then playing music was um, just felt a lot more comfortable for me to be able to express what I was creating mm -hmm. um, and I definitely felt like I needed to like I couldn't just like write stuff and stash it away I've always felt like I needed to get things out and share them mm. um, and that whole like DIY scene that I kind of came up in was all about just everybody makes stuff. It's not like you are important because you make stuff. It's just like everybody's making things, and you just kind of share the thing you made. And so mm -hmm. the songwriting was like, I wasn't even writing full songs. I think before I was playing a show, I was like, here's half of the song, or uh. like, here's a little idea I had, you know. And I feel like that was just kind of the nature of the scene that I was a part of. It's an interesting aspect of writing. I know some people like to sort of hoard away what they have until it's completely and utterly finished yeah. and shiny, and other people like to just sort of toss it out. Well, now people. now having a backlog of things I wish I waited for to be shinier before I like <laughs> show the world, Like I could see that being uh, useful in just like the presentation part of the art, but I, I feel like I have yet to like really get there. I feel like the process is more important to me even than the final product, you know, and like I have to kind of remind myself, no, it's important. The final product is actually what some people just do want to see that, and that's like actually that, I mean, that's understandably, like that's the art. That's the art in its full craft. Like you don't want to see people warming up. You want to see their dance. Like mm -hmm. It's not necessary to see the whole piece, but the process is so important for the therapeutic part of the experience that I think for a long time I didn't really have that 
awareness around the two being so importantly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've always been in the camp of... Wait for it. Yeah, just sort of like (laughs) accumulating all these things and holding them really close. And then like when one of them is like, I feel really proud of it, then, you know, show it to somebody. Make sure the turtle can reach the ocean before you <laughs> let it out of the nest. Sure. I've ah. never heard that one before, but yes. No, Sitting I on just your turtles. Made it up. Is that yours? <laughs> 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 so do you feel you, you've you've written songs you're, you're happy with then? I mean, you said that you, you feel like you haven't quite gotten there yet. W- do you mean that with the process or with the songs themselves? Oh, I feel like it's still always a continuous, like, changing the shape of things. I think sometimes maybe they were better before you tried to perfect them, mm. you know, or, like, they've changed shape. Like, there's, I think songs get a sweet spot. I don't know that they always hold the same place. I don't know that it's always the idea of, like, it's going to get better because I'm going to know more. You know, like, some uh-huh. of them, I feel like some of the stuff I was writing in my early 20s were, lyrically, I feel like it's way more interesting than what I can figure out how to write right now but I hope I'm not like I hope that's not true forever I hope that when I'm like 60 I'm like wow that stuff when I was in my 30s was look cool you know like I mean I hope that it's not an end point but I just feel like the whole part of it all all along is I feel like I've yet to be satisfied for sure mm. like that was exactly what I wanted to do but I also feel like that's knowing that about myself means that if I continue with the idea that things have to be perfect before they go out like I'll never get there. We've, we've also a thin line. You've also released was it five albums in four years? Is it? <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. two years in a row releasing two albums. Mm-hmm. Boy, what's yeah? We, we tried to not. We're not releasing an album this year. So we didn't release that was very on purposeful. this one. Yeah. We both have a solo record that will come out next year, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You didn't record like five and just keep them. No. Uh, to the side. <laughs> if it had been up to me, it would have been like, and this, and this, and this, and this. But I think we kind of needed a little. We needed breathe. a little breather. Yeah, <laughs> we've had a pretty light year. I think we'll kick it back into gear next year and release these solo records next year and um, start working on another Lowe's Pair record. Hmm. Oh, you're releasing solo albums? Um, next yeah, year? the plan is yeah next year to be releasing two solo albums. They're both done. We're just trying to figure out what exactly to do with them. Did you both play on each other's solo albums, or is we, it completely... We kind of set a hard line that we couldn't... Well, we kind of waffled on it, but eventually we just... Yeah, we just didn't. Uh-huh. But we recorded them both in the same town, at the same studio. Yeah, yeah, even with some of the other players. I think we were yeah, just like, we, there are oh players yeah, I'm over here. Like, <laughs> you're over there. Yeah, just didn't producer. have something that was separate, but... Uh, I don't know whether that was necessary or not at this point. It's just what it is. Uh, is there a little friendly competition of... No, com- Mine's almost no competition. Done. No competition. Yeah. I would say more like just. I think they're completely different records. They're completely different. Yeah, they have nothing um, to do with each other. Maybe that was the point of like everything we do is together. So to have something that doesn't have to do with the other person was kind of feeling like you know, it's a lot to wrap yourself up in somebody else's life. <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. kind yeah, of I mean, we had spent three years where like our like every aspect of our lives were just the two of us 24-7 you mm-hmm. know um, everything <laughs> um, so I think yeah he's it, smiling really big when he says <laughs> well that, that gets back to the question about standing up there with you know with, with the two of you and, w- and one microphone if you're spending 24-7 together and there's the tiniest little crack you know that's how do you keep that from showing up there when it's just the, the oh I'm the sure two. from time to time it is shown <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> well, the other day, because he's learning a new guitar technique right now, so his fingers are bleeding on his guitar. And that, yes, often, that when we were close yeah. enough to each other, I was like, you need to wash your guitar. <laughs> and I was like, you need to not tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a moment that was like, you know, like we're standing next to each other and that's a problem. But I don't know. Like we kind of You're getting blood on me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's hardly like, you know the Davies brothers from the Kinks throwing symbols at each other's heads. That's no... Yeah, no, it could I mean, be worse, yeah. We, we're, I think in the world of it, we're pretty nice to each other. I think, like, I can, I can like, picture the few times where we've actually, like, roared at each other, like, in the car or something, and I feel like in the world of, of hostility, like, 
that's the reason we're still together is that we can handle it <laughs> and the, the two solo albums were they uh are they musically different because there are things that, that you wanted to try that you didn't want to try together? For me, they, uh, well, the songs that I was writing at that period were, to me, like, just so intensely personal, it didn't make any sense to have anybody else involved in them. Mm -hmm. I really just needed to take control of what the outcome was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I did that. Half the record is just me by myself. Because I didn't really want anybody else on it. And then the other half of the record was just um, a bunch of folks from town in Olympia. Another friend of mine flew in from Denver. And um, we all just ran through the tunes maybe three or four times. Then we went out for drinks, woke up the next morning, ran through everything once to make sure we remembered how it went, and just right, went right into the studio. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just kind of. I just kind of wanted to, honestly, I wanted to work on a project, too, where I just, like, had a f the final say and no one was going to, like, question <laughs> my decisions, you know? I was just, uh -huh. like, I just want to do me, you know? Um, uh -huh. So that, on top of the songs, were, like, very personal. Um, I think it was a really important thing to have done. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I guess Kendall would have to speak about her experience to really see if that is why records were different I mean we just write different types of songs too I think I think I just like I'm always writing so when I went there I think I recorded like 25 songs and we just picked 11 mm. or something it's more of just like I don't know like here's this here's this here's this and really it was a lot for me to just be like trying not to put more on him pressure wise to like play with me <laughs> or learn my songs because give him kind of a chance to like do his own thing for a little bit because mm -hmm. Because I am, I think, like, excited all the time. And, like, oh, let's try this, let's try this. I'm also very open to, like, okay, cool, let's try that. Um, but, like, I think we kind of have a bit of a turtle in the hair. Definitely have a tortoise going. in the hair thing, yeah. <laughs> Where he gets there and probably wins, you know. Like, when he, when he writes songs, it's, like, <laughs> it's, like, the best thing ever. I just have a lot of energy. Like, I mean, I run around circles just to keep myself, like, in a normal place with other people. Literally. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Do you collaborate on songs a lot, or is it just off? I, you bring the songs in that you wrote, and uh, we have collaborated. It comes and goes. Yeah, it's in, it's in phases. I think we'd like to consciously work together on like a songwriting session again. Um, the Sacred Hearts session album that was primarily songs that we had written together from you know start to finish. But the it's majority of it seems to have been like one of us coming with an idea or maybe even a fleshed out thing and then the other person building on that. Yeah, I feel like uh, the product of our collaborations have been really good. The stress it put on our like relationship was pretty difficult. <laughs> <laughs> what What are the songs that, uh, what are a few songs that you, that are, you consider both of yours as opposed to this is mine and this is his? Scavenger Hunt, we wrote Scavenger Hunt, right? Minnesota, Minnesota Many, Many. Yeah. I had the chorus, and we worked on the verses together. Mm, Hogtied, would you say that's mostly yours? Hogtied, we, I fleshed it out, but we were together when it was, like, written. Mm. So a little cane. Yeah, you more fleshed that one out. Howling There's Tune, a couple songs from that together. session that I still would have wished that we would have, like, kept and worked up. You could pull it out. Mm. should try to find them. Sure, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. yeah. hopefully it's recorded and saved somewhere. We did, at the, when we first we started it. hanging out, we heard about this song, this uh, game called the Twenty Song Game. Mm -hmm. And so we lock, basically, we lock yourself in a space for twelve hours and make twenty songs and record them all. Mm -hmm. And the idea just being that you can't use anything that you've used before. You can't like not an old lick, not an old lyric. Um, is that the rules? Yeah, and anything goes. Anything's a song. Yeah, yeah, you, you can just have to like do twenty of them in twelve sounds hours, and like you're like, yeah, that's melodic. I'll so we did, one. we did it like <laughs> six times that winter. We the first one, I think it was the first one we did. We um, went to the abominable snow mansion in Taos, New yeah, Mexico. That's the only one we did together. Uh huh. And we started there, and then when we got back to Olympia, maybe two weeks later, we did one once a week for the next five weeks, maybe. 
on our own, but at the same time, so we could share on the like in thing. yeah in the same house, and then we'd come together and like share the songs at the end of the night. So, how many unreleased songs do you think you have between the th- the two of you at this point? Oh God, Kendall's probably probably has hundreds. <laughs> Is that yeah. true? Would you say hundreds? Yeah, probably. I mean, <laughs> in like a weird way. Like, uh, if you don't sing them, do they? exist i don't know like, <laughs> they, you know what i mean like because you sing them once it's hard to say because you sing in the shower like that could be a song like mm-hmm. it's hard to say i think that's part of what songs makes that are written somewhere that that you could play yeah hundreds for sure i feel like it's often maybe at least once every couple months or something like one of kendall kendall's fans will request a song that maybe that, i put up on a youtube or yeah something or i've friend. never heard of or kendall's like oh, how did you find like I've never yeah because sometimes I'll get a wild whim like, to like record it I'll put it up and I'll be like oh, a couple days later like what was I thinking I should take this off and then someone in the meantime heard it <laughs> you find little nuggets that way sometimes like something that's on your uh, on your desktop that you wrote yeah. five years ago that you just don't know why you didn't do anything with that one yeah or ones that I even did do but I just feel like we could do so much better I mean as soon as I met Palmer I feel like I've met my like musical partner like there's I would love to redo any song I've ever done and do it with you know because if when you are in, interested in a song of mine like in singing with me like it's just like I don't know it just it's a totally different it's like a the peanut butter and jelly sort of phenomenon which <laughs> one am I uh you're definitely peanut butter sweet I hate jelly <laughs> <laughs> Some peanut butters, some people just want the peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's the Reese's Pieces people. They, you got your peanut butter and my chocolate. You got your chocolate and my peanut butter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so well, how different is this than bands you've worked in before? Um, the last string band I was in, I wrote probably 90% of the material. Um and a couple other guys would write songs from time to time and bring them in. Um, but then I, for that band, I was writing almost exclusively on the banjo. Mm. So coming up with sort of the harmonic shape was really sort of up to the band. Like they would kind of like dictate like what the chord progression was and things like that that would make the song make sense. Um, and find you know and help arrange arrange it i kind of came brought skeletons to the table um mm-hmm. i feel like with with kendall i'm bringing more like fleshed out material to the table most often mm-hmm. um for whatever reason i am not i've not really thought about why that is mm-hmm. what about you what was your experience before um, well, the string band I was in, we started off as a trio and it kind of grew, and eventually we had like three or four songwriters, but we would take songs and just tear them up together, and like, it was like, um, awesome in retrospect, like it wasn't always easy, because you bring kind of this formed thing, and you have an, a, an ownership around it, and you're bringing it to a group, and they're like taking it apart, and that was mm-hmm. hard, but I kind of really enjoyed what would happen to a song in a group. Mm-hmm setting um yeah we don't really do that too much right now but we have yeah a little bit but it's not as common we definitely kind of bring out more fully fleshed ideas and probably because we're just kind of learning what works Mm -hmm. like easily with the two of us and um i mean there's some songs like we'll throw into the mix and immediately they just work like during a moment you played once and like we could just perform it Mm -hmm. and i feel like that's really keeping it simple for our project is probably the smartest thing we can do. But then there's a couple that we've like worked out. Like we are bleeding this new tune. Um, it's really still complicated, kind of coming along. and it's really kind of epic. It's like not it doesn't really make sense, and like you, it would be a jam buster in a heartbeat. You know, like mm-hmm. we have to know it, and that's kind of fun because I, I feel like we've taken a long time to try to get into performance level. Well, it's. I think it'd be easy to forget since you have five albums out. You've, how, you've you haven't been together that long, right? It's been th- is 2014. Is that when you, that's the first album, right? Yeah, that probably. sounds right. Yeah, so, so the band probably started maybe five or six months before that. Right, and you met in 
you're from Arkansas and you're from Olympia and you met in Mississippi and you're based in Minneapolis. Is that, do I have that? <laughs> oh, no, but that's, no, that's an interesting version. No, I'm actually, I'm from Minneapolis. Um, Kendall is from Arkansas, but she's been in Olympia for a long since time. Like, like almost half my life now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we actually met at um, a bluegrass festival in southeastern Minnesota on the mm -hmm. Mississippi River. We met because both met. of our string bands were playing at the same festival. Yeah, like a few and years in a row. Kind of hit it off and didn't really talk again for another four or five years before Until we started. Until our bands broke up. Yeah, our bands broke up, and then Palmer was like, "Do you want to start a double banjo duo?" Uh, and you were like, "Weird." Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> you were you were living in the same city at that point. No. Mm -hmm. No. I was working on a solo project out of Olympia. Knew I wanted to hit the road, mm -hmm. and knew that I wanted have a lot of flexibility with whatever soundscape I chose to. The solo stuff was going really well, um, but I've always been a big fan of his voice and songwriting, and he wanted to hit the road at the same time. We are kind of just in a similar space to mm -hmm. explore. I just really needed to get like. out. I was in a space where I needed, I needed a shift, you know. Um, yeah. Well, can, can you be unhappy and play the banjo? That was Steve Martin's <laughs> riff on it that you did. I you would say you can. If you think that you, yeah, if you think you can't, you haven't listened to a lowest pair record. There's some <laughs> but pretty, also, uh, mopey banjo. Being tunes. unhappy, <laughs> being unhappy and like feeling it sometimes feels good. Hmm. You know, what I mean, it's, I mean, maybe. You're, so that's like maybe an oxymoron in itself. To feel feels good, I think. To feel feels good, yeah. Um, yeah, especially sort of being like a scan, you know, being a Scandinavian from the Midwest. Uh, I think a lot of my cultural upbringing was like not very welcoming of emotional experiences, you know. And I think that was really the biggest catalyst that turned me on to creating art in general, you know. Mm. And I've been sort of like writing stories and things since I was like a little kid, you know, just I don't know, needing to have that, you know. And then I listened to I don't know. I think it was just really what, w the reason that music is what did it for me was um, the way that it can set a scene and tell a story. Like it really, more than any other art form, to me it just creates an entire atmosphere. It can really transport you to another place, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it can unite an, an entire room of like 50, 60, 100 people to all have this in intense emotional experience and might not even understand what's going on, but next thing you know, there's like a dozen people who are crying in the room and feel like it's, and that's okay to be doing that, you know? Right, um, it's a strange thing, a song you've played a hundred times and all of a sudden somebody's crying at it. Can you forget sometimes, you know, just how much this might mean to somebody who's hearing it? I think it's easy to for forget, yeah, but I really do try not to. I really try to put myself into an emotional place to be able to um, transmit that energy mm -hmm. honestly and effectively, you know, like, it might not be, like, what the story is about, what the song is about, but generally, like, kind of capturing the mood early on, like, before the song starts or early on in the song and kind of capturing that mood with, like, some sort of memory and, or association that I have. Mm -hmm. So I can really like embody that and um, and try to create that space because that space is so important to me mm -hmm. um, to um, to have other people have had done that to me was absolutely the biggest reason that I do what I do. Mm -hmm. Does it work the same way for you? I'm sorry, what were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> He was trying yeah, so yeah, hard yeah. to make you emotional, <laughs> and now he's <laughs> disassociated the whole thing. I'm just kidding. No, it's totally challenging because it's like your heart, most heartfelt tunes are like you were there when you wrote them, and they're honestly like a place that you go to a lot when you write. And other when you sing them, like I feel like it's the neatest thing to have the same song that meant a whole lot about this one thing when you wrote it transform and then you recognize that it has like kind of legs and why it has legs because it's like maybe it's about someone when you wrote it but it changes even within yourself over time mm 
Yeah. Give Sometimes. it legs and it runs away from you. Yeah, or like you're just kind of like, yeah, it gets you in front of somebody else. You're like, wow, this experience is still true. And I can see how it could be more uh, valid to my current experience or or something. Or, or you get trapped in like a moment that you like, we're super heartbroken and have to return to it every <laughs> night for the rest of your life. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I definitely, definitely the authenticity piece of it is, I think is really important to both of us. Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to be faking who I am or how I am with people, which can be really challenging because when you're low energy or something and you're on stage, it's kind of a strange thing to try to push through that and give somebody a good show or mm -hmm. or be present with the song when you really don't want to go there <laughs> we so have enough songs we can kind of skip them if we're not present with them or whatever too do you sort of work on the fly each night for you, or do you have a song a set list we have tunes that we don't have to tune a lot in between or yeah we kind of build oh, yeah. like sets of maybe three songs two to four songs where mm -hmm. we're not tuning so much or changing instruments in between them just to keep a little bit of a flow and some concept of like a small handful of these sets work really well to start a set or end a set things like that mm -hmm. so going forward if if people are big fans of your work so far together will they recognize the the uh you two on the, the your solo albums coming out yeah absolutely i think we sound very much like ourselves uh-huh and on the ears is amazing, and it sounds very much like you. I'll speak for the for you. I'll speak yeah. for him. Uh, <laughs> will you do the same for her? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm way into it. Yeah, Kendall writes amazing songs, and just prolifically all the time. Mm. I don't know how I would have narrowed it down. Sonically, oh, it's oh. a... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's it. Sonically, it's a similar palette, or did you... Yeah, it is. Yeah, like it definitely I sounds like a Kendall Winter record, I think. Right? It's not too far out. Have you heard it? Yeah. Well, I mean, not if, not if you've done more to it since last spring. I think there's, yeah, there's like one or two that has a little production, but mostly it's like really bare. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not playing as much banjo on it. Like, it's funny, I have yet to put out a banjo record that feels like a show is like what I can do on banjo. Mm -hmm. But I think that to me would be really intimidating. Like, these are just songs. Uh. And I play some on the banjo and some on the guitar, but it's not like anything fancy happening but I'm proud of the songs and they're, they're pretty bare what's the next album together do you have songs piled up for that yet I'm starting to get there yeah. Kendall definitely Kendall's always got a pile um, I only, we only have like four of mine that we've like kind of started to work on is that right yeah. we have one of yours so we're starting to work on mm -hmm. yeah it's still just in the formative stages for sure we're still even writing for it mm -hmm. at this point we're hoping to do another. I reckon I'm fixing on kicking around to pick a little. Mm -hmm. volume I wonder if that'll come first or not. I, I'm picking a little more. <laughs> reckon I'm, I, I re reckon. I re reckon I'm fixing re on kicking to pick a little. My favorite was <laughs> that, uh, do you know Stephen Wright, the comedian? Mm -mm. His first album, oh, it must have been the, in the, the early, it was maybe 83 or 84 somewhere around that was called I Have a Pony and then he released one about uh, was it six seven years ago called I Still Have a Pony <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite <laughs> sequel <Red. album. laughs> sorry Stephen if I have the the, the dates wrong <laughs> so wh when are the uh, when are the solo albums coming out mine's uh, oh, go ahead. mine's coming out on Team Love in the springtime mm-hmm May, uh, May we hope. I was aiming for the fall, but no, I think I'm aiming for the spring. I still have no idea. Uh -huh. I have no plan for mine. I mean, it's finished. I just, you know, tortoise versus the hare. Mm -hmm. Kendall's ready to go. Right. See. And that's a part of the whole thing <laughs> that's kind of just strange is was we, I don't know, like it's, we don't want our records to be like next, well, the question was, we're two different people, we actually. Like, we don't. Year, yeah. Like, we do this thing that is for our fans as our individual thing, or, like, can we be, can we still keep our separateness, like, while mm -hmm. having a project together, and is it okay for us just to, like, have the other thing that we do? Is it have to always be? 
Yeah, we even played with the idea of like releasing them together, sort of like a speaker box and the love below uh -huh. kind of thing. Um, oh, it shows my age. I was thinking the Kiss albums. They released <laughs> the four solo albums together. No, and I think I'm strategically and commercially that would make sense, but... I don't know which one would make more sense. I don't know which would, yeah. But that's not necessarily what we're doing. But yeah, I don't think that's going to be what we're doing. So you've got about eight more dates left this year, and then what's next for you guys? Um, we're going to be on the West Coast all winter, I think. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, hopefully just staying, staying close to home, since we're both in Oli now, um, so we can just keep working on new material and just touring up and down the coast and avoiding driving into the snow. Mm -hmm. um, then we're going to go to the UK in the spring and then start touring nationally again mm -hmm. uh, when we get back. Well, thanks for, for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having mm -hmm. us. Yes, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. Thanks again to Kendall and Palmer for sitting down with me to talk, and thanks to Cinema Salem for giving us a quiet place to have a conversation. The lowest pair will be playing some dates close to home in Washington State in March before heading off to Europe for a tour. You can find them on Facebook, Twitter, and on the web at thelowestpair.com. And if you enjoy the Department of Tangents podcast, please consider giving it a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher. It does help spread the word. You can also find out more on Facebook, Twitter, and at departmentoftangents.com. Now, our featured track for this week comes from Girlfriend at the Time, the new album from comedian Paige Weldon. If you're listening to this episode fresh the day of its release, February 23rd, you're in luck. Weldon's album is available today on iTunes and on her website, pageweldon.com. And you can also see some short videos she made there. Weldon is a great writer, smart comic, and a disarming performer. Please enjoy Paige Weldon. I'm excited the end of my set's coming up because I love leaving. <laughs> it's my favorite part of every event. <laughs> it is the reason I came here tonight. <laughs> what a release, huh? <laughs> it's gonna be great. I just think leaving is better than every other part of an event, you know? Like, showing up somewhere sucks. You show up somewhere, you have to learn things. You have to, like, figure out where the snacks are, who to avoid. <laughs> When you leave somewhere, you ate all the snacks. <laughs> you avoided everyone. <laughs> You're done. You can go home and imagine the people who are still there missing you, <laughs> asking where you went. You might even get a did you leave text. You ever get a did you leave text? It's like, fuck yeah, I did. <laughs> And I am not responding to this until 2 p.m. tomorrow. <laughs> you are going to wonder what happened to this. <laughs> I love leaving so much that sometimes when I'm not actually leaving a place and someone gets confused and says goodbye to me, I will just go. <laughs> I'm like, you're right, incredible idea, I'll take off. I forgot I could do that. <laughs> like, I love leaving so much that I don't ever really want kids, but I think I probably will start a family someday just so I can leave them. <laughs> It'd be like the ultimate leaving achievement. <laughs> I feel incredible. I'm not really going to do that. I might. I don't know. Um, it could be fun. Uh, I know the main thing people don't like about leaving is saying goodbye, right? It could be like hard or awkward to say goodbye. But did you know you don't have to? You could just leave, no one cares. Um, <laughs> no one cares. I think if you're the kind of person that finds everyone at the party to say goodbye before you leave, it's because you have incredible self-esteem. Because <laughs> what you're doing is you're going up to everyone individually and saying, hey, I'm not going to be here anymore. <laughs> Thought you might want to know that. <laughs> when I go to leave a place, I just mutter to myself, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go. <laughs> Dear Young. <laughs>